We have the honor of being here with Nobel laureate uh, Professor Shechtman, who uh, Shlomo Meital, Professor Shlomo Meital will introduce in just a second. I'll just tell everybody that um, you can send in your text-based questions in the chat, and uh, Professor Meital will be fielding them uh, um, to Professor Shechtman. Um, and we look forward to we look forward to hearing your questions. So. Um, professor Shlomo Meital is a professor emeritus of economics at the Technion at, at MIT. He's the author of many books. He's a runner. He's a journalist. He uh, writes the Marketplace column at, in the Jerusalem Report, which I highly recommend that you all read. Uh, he, for many, many years, co-taught a class with uh, Professor Shechtman, which I'm sure they'll talk about. Um, uh, and he's interested in entrepreneurship and business uh, uh, leadership. And, um, and innovation. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, uh, he is also a uh, regular Israel Story contributor. Um, and perhaps most importantly, um, uh, he is a frequent babysitter to uh, his uh, three grandchildren, um, Eliana, Tzvi, and uh, Lev, which allows his son, Yochai, who you just met uh, in, the, uh, in the previous session, uh, actually work and create Israel story. So um, with that, I will pass it along uh, to Shlomo, just reminding you to, um, to send in your questions via the chat. Um, and um, I hope we, I'm sure we will all uh, uh, be very, very honored and uh, enjoy this, uh, this next session. So hi Shlomo, hi Professor Shechman, and uh, no. take it away. Thank you, Mishy. thank you. Thank you. Um, Hi, Danny. Chag Sameer. Hi. So I'm, I'm really happy to be chatting with you, uh, Danny. Uh, and uh, as Mishy mentioned, uh, in 2011, you won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Uh, I'm going to call you Danny uh, with no disrespect because we've been friends and known each other for, for over 40 years. Uh, let me just tell our viewers, uh, this is your chance to fire questions at a Nobel laureate. Um, we ask you to do this by chat, and uh, we'll allot 10 minutes toward the end. Danny and I will chat for 20 minutes, and we'll have 10 minutes uh, for some of your questions. Uh, if you wish, um, include your name, <clears throat> and, um, and uh, I hope we can get to many questions. So, Danny, let's, let's roll. Um, I, I think your Nobel Prize journey, Danny, began um, when you were seven years old. Tell us about the gift that you got, uh, your grandfather gave you. Um, tell us about the book you read when you were eight and maybe the microscope you, you found <clears throat> in, in school when you were, when you were very small. <clears throat> right. Well, when I was young, as you mentioned, eight years old, I think it was seven years old, doesn't matter. My grandfather, who was really the man I admired uh, when I was young and admire him still now, gave me a wonderful gift. And that gift was a magnifying glass. Something like this, <clears throat> a magnifying glass. And I was walking in the field of Ramat Gan near Tel Aviv, looking at everything small, flowers, insects, grain of sand, you name it. And I fell in love with the world of small things. Later on, when I was in the fifth grade, uh, the teacher, of nature told us we have a microscope in school. Oh, I said, can you bring it to class? Oh, yes, yes. And then the next week, uh, you know, microscope teacher, uh, can you bring it? Oh, yes, yes. Well, finally, after bugging me for a long time, he brought it to class and he said, Dan, you are the most interested uh, child. You will be first to look at the microscope. I looked at the microscope at his desk and wow, it was an amazing view of a lift and you could, uh, you could see the very fine details um, and the chlorophyll moving there, amazing. And the teacher says, okay, sit down then, let the other, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Later on, uh, when I really grew up and did my master's degree at the Technion and later on my PhD at the Technion, the Technion bought the first transmission electron microscope. And I spent day and night with a technician who built the microscope to look how he did it. And I became an expert, not only on the structure of the microscope, 
but what you can do with a microscope and a transmission electron microscope is a magnificent powerful tool to study microstructure of materials and also the crystallography of crystals. The book, um, I brought here a new version of the book. It's called Mystery Island. This is in Hebrew, Mystery Island. I just bought a new version of it. Uh, this is the book that uh, was written by Jules Verne. And it's a story about five people stranded on an island. The island has everything. It's not a desert island but uh, no people. And they built a life there. And the leader, uh, his name uh, in the book is Cyrus Smith. The leader um, could do everything. And he was an engineer. And I wanted to be like him. He was my role model. I wanted to be an engineer like Cyrus Smith in the book. Somebody who can do everything. This is what I wanted to be. Well, I went to the Technion, studied mechanical engineering for four years. And when I graduated, the year was 1966, I was the happiest person in the world, certified mechanical engineer from the Technion. I could not find a job. There was a big recession in Israel and that changed my life because I said, well, I will do my master's degree for two years, get some salary as a TA. And by that time I was married, you know, and uh, well, after that I will find a job. And I did find a job after two years, but during these two years, I fell in love with science, continued from my PhD, and that's more or less sealed my fate. Cool, good story. So Danny, let's talk about ties. I want to show the viewers uh, this wonderful tie. Um, and this is, well, do you have the same tie, Danny? What a coincidence. <laughs> Just so happens. <laughs> what a coincidence. So this is the famous Sheikh Malai tie. Let me explain the tie. Uh, this tie is a graphic version of the quasi-crystalline material that, that, that you discovered. Uh, you photographed this with an electron microscope on April 8th, 1982. We know the date because you had a lab diary and you wrote everything down very, very carefully. Um, but what's un unusual about quasi-crystalline uh, material, um, according to theory at the time, it shouldn't exist. Um, and the world's leading crystallographer, Linus Pauling, winner of two Nobel Prizes, denied this existed and in front of a thousand people at a conference called you a, a quasi-scientist um, and he vilified you to, to his dying day. He never accepted that your finding. For five years, 1982 to 1987, um, basically you, you, were, you were criticized and vilified. Tell us about this period when you uh, were certain about your discovery and you stuck to your guns and eventually were proved right. Okay. I prepared a couple of pictures. To understand regular crystals, regular means that they are ordered and periodic. Here is a picture of a crystal of gold. You can see that the atoms are very well ordered. It's not like tennis balls in a sack. There is order here, okay? And that order in all crystals, before my discovery, all crystals were periodic. Here is a plane in, of, the, of that crystal, one plane, not three-dimensional, just two-dimensional. And you can see that there is order here. But there is also periodicity. What does it mean? Look at these red lines. Go along each one of these red lines, and you will see that there is periodicity, equal distance between two atoms in each and every direction that you go, equal distances. This is periodicity. All crystals, hundreds of thousands of crystals, we are ordered and periodic. And I found a crystal which was ordered, but not periodic. But you have to understand that anything but periodicity was allowed in crystal, only periodicity. And the, then there cannot be anything else. And there are proofs upon proof that there is nothing else but periodicity. I found one which is non-periodic. It opened a field of quasi-periodic materials. There are hundreds of them. I found the first three ones, but I published only one of them, which is a, a structure of aluminum, 25 weight percent uh, manganese. And uh, when I published that paper with colleagues in 1984, hell broke loose. Because from all over the world, I started to receive messages, emails, telephone, Danny, we have it, we have it. This is fantastic. People repeated my, um, my experiments, 
first produced the first part of the crystal, and then there was a community of thousands upon thousands of people around the world in all the industrial countries, people who studied prosopiotic materials, thousands of them. And there were more than 10,000 papers published on prosopiotic material. They took my discovery and turned it into a thriving science. And this was a community of avant-garde young scientists. Linus Pauling is a different story. He was belonged to uh, the old generation. You know, the only difference between God and Linus Pauling is that God doesn't think he's Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling <laughs> thought he was uh, an upper entity. He thought he understood everything. He did not. And uh, while he was indeed uh, one of the greatest scientists in the world, definitely the greatest chemist in the United States, I was an expert in transmission electromicroscopy, and he was not. And that was that. Well. Wow. Fascinating. So, Donnie, I think some of our viewers may be aspire to win a Nobel Prize. So let's let's talk about what it takes. Um, you gave your Nobel lecture in Stockholm at Stockholm University on December eighth, uh, two thousand eleven, uh, and uh, one of your slides asks a really interesting question. You weren't the first to look at an electron microscope a microscope photograph of quasi crystalline material. Other people had looked at it, but they didn't see it. They didn't see it, and then they didn't discover it. So why, why? And you cite five reasons, and four of those reasons uh, are related to character, not too much to science. Professionalism, tenacity, believing in yourself, uh, courage. Tell us a bit about those, the role those qualities played um, in, in your own Nobel Prize. Okay, um, let's talk about professionalism. My recommendation to young people who want to become great scientists is very simple. I tell them, if you want to be a great scientist, contribute to science and to society, you have to know a little bit about every science. You have to know something about biology and physics and chemistry. You have to know the language of mathematics. Uh, you have to know physiology. You have to understand science, what's allowed, what's not allowed. You have to know the laws of thermodynamics. But on top of that, you have to become expert in something and choose something you like. And even now, when you're in high school, you can choose something you like and become an expert in it. You can do that. And very quickly, because uh, information is available everywhere now, you can become an expert in something you like. And if you know a lot about science and become an expert in something, I promise you, you'll be a great scientist. That's about uh, professionalism. Tenacity, never give up. If you are a professional and you are sure that you are correct and everybody else says, no, 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 there are no quasi-quists, are just quasi-scientists like Lionel Spolgen at this time. No, tenacity. Continue, continue. Be like a Rottweiler dog. You bite, you don't let go. Now, a word about believing in yourself. If you are a professional, if you are an expert in your field, you can believe in yourself, right? Because you are a professional, because you are one of the best in your field, you can believe in yourself and uh, stand tall. And that goes with courage, okay? If you have these characteristics, have the courage against criticism, stand taller. I am right. I'm listening, you know, I'm open to criticism, but I judge myself if I am right or not. These are the four characteristics that I mentioned in that uh, lecture. That's really interesting. And uh, I'm going to refer to some questions that we can see in the, in the chat, Donnie related to what you just said. Um, so you took an electron microscope, a photograph of an aluminum alloy uh, in April, um, and, and you, you found this quasi-crystalline um, pattern. Uh, the, my, the viewers ask, were you looking for this or did you stumble on it? Because many scientific discoveries, you kind of stumble on them. How, how did you get this? I did stumble on it, but I stumbled on it during a very 
meticulous, precise study of many, many alloys with different composition. One after the other, I studied the microstructure. And when I arrived at this composition of aluminum 25 weight percent manganese, I found it there. I want to mention something about it. You know, most scientists are um, given funds to study something practical, something that can be applied. And, and there is very little money for basic science. So we cheat. Yes, we take the money. Yes, we do everything that we were supposed to do. Yes, we report. But we also, we also, as professionals, do basic studies. Doing the applied study, we do basic study. And this was the case there. An example, aluminum 2%, 5% manganese can be useful. 25% not useful, but very interesting. And that, there it was. So yes, do the basic, but also do good science. And follow your and curiosity. Upon it. I mean, a yep. word about it. Yes, I stumbled upon it. And yes. many people may have did it before, but I said, I have to understand this. I need to understand what's going on in this structure. And I repeated myself and I built models and, and indeed several people helped me, especially Ilan Blech, who was a professor at the Technion at the time. He developed a model that could explain my findings and together we published the first paper on quasi periodic materials. Yes, mm -hmm. Lomo, I'm listening. Okay. Um, so Danny, uh, leaving the scientific area briefly, um, you and I and many other Israelis have uh, shared some deep apprehension, let's call it agony, with, with our Israeli political leaders. And most of us just sort of mumble grumble and complain. And you actually did something very characteristic of Dan Chechman. And you became a candidate for president of Israel in 2014. And you knew that the odds were pretty steep against you, but that's never deterred you. Tell us a bit about this part, about chapter of your life when you chose to become a candidate for president of Israel. Okay, uh, let me explain a few things to the listeners of, out of this country. The president of Israel is not elected by the people. The president is elected by Knesset members, the parliament members. There are 120 parliament members. They elect the presidents. And over time, while, while our first president was a scientist, and there were a couple of scientists after that. Um, over time, our parliament confiscated their position. It's theirs. And, and only politicians nowadays can become uh, presidents. This is not right. This is not the law. But they choose. So they choose one of themselves. One among them will become president. I can tell you now that after President Rivlin, which I like, by the way, uh, there will be another president, member of the parliament. No, nobody else can come. And I tried to get in as an outsider, and I knew that my chances were very slim, but I wanted to go through the process. And over time, the people liked me very much because they were, um, they asked people in the street, um, who is your best candidate? And I was number two or number one. Uh, during all that race, but the people don't choose the president. So this was it. The reason I wanted to become president is, is one. I wanted to affect the education system in my country. I wanted to talk to people on the regular manner on the, over television or other media and talk about the importance of education in Israel, we have a severe problem of education. Many people are not well educated, and this should not be the so. You know, the most important national resource of every country is not the oil. You see now the price of oil, okay? If you buy Negative. a barrel of oil, give you a dollar, okay? This is the case nowadays, unbelievable. But because people don't have where to store it. Uh, it's not oil, it's not coal, it's not metal, it's not mineral, it's human ingenuity. The most important natural resource is human ingenuity and every country has to invest in this natural resource. And every country has it. We all have that. Invest in, your, in the ingenuity of your people. And this is the message I wanted uh, to carry. 
um, the fact was that uh, uh, parliament members did not vote for me, and uh, that was fine with me, and I stay away. I, did, I stay away from politics. I didn't think that I go into politics when I wanted to become president. I thought that the president of Israel should not be a politician. If you're a politician, you belong to a party. You are one right. track person, but you should be president of all people, right? Oh, well, forget mm -hmm. about it. So, Danny, I'm going to fire a bunch of questions from you. We have a whole string of questions from, from viewers uh, who are fascinated by, by what you're saying. Question from Lee, Lee Doron. Um, so, Lee Doron's teenage son um, wants to become an expert in video games. Is there a way to ignite curiosity and passion for science, technology, and math in a child who's more interested in entertainment? And I know, Danny, I'll just mention this. You have done an amazing TV program teaching science to kindergarten children, and you ignite their interest at age five or six. So what do we say to Lee Doron? <clears throat> okay, I want to answer the question to this young man, a woman, I don't know, uh, who talks about being an expert in video games. You know, um, you prepare yourself for the world uh, by playing video games. Um, I can tell you that uh, I always lose when I play video games with my grandchildren. I always lose. They are so much faster than I am. Uh, anyway, so um, if you want uh, to fly unmanned uh, vehicles, uh, being an uh, expert in video game will help you a lot. You can do a very good job. Uh, you can do uh, uh, other jobs that need your uh, eye hand um, coordination. There are many. Uh, there are many professions that need this special expertise of eye-hand coordination and fast response. Uh, it's up to you to find uh, that field, but there, these fields exist and there are quite a few of them, and there will be many more in the future. I think you are going, you are doing a good job uh, playing now. Now it's a game. In the future, it can be a profession. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, we have a question from Guillaume in Brazil at Sao Paulo uh, University. I think I know who that is, I visited there. And uh, he mentions that you really brought entrepreneurship to Technion. You initiated a course in 1987, long before Israel became startup nation. You saw the future. You saw the future, not only for Israel, for other countries. The future is innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship. And after your Nobel Prize, uh, you. You scoured the world and still do it, talking to world leaders, Croatia, uh, bringing the message of entrepreneurship. Uh, how did you see this in 1987, 33 years ago? Okay, to all listeners, Shlomo Maital was my number one partner in entrepreneurship. We are, we were, we are a team in that endeavor. Entrepreneurship, I will, I will be very quick. When I was a student at the Technion, which is a great, Technical University, the Technion spirit told us, not in words, but in spirit, you'll be so good that when you graduate, everybody will want to hire you. And I said, this is wonderful, but what if I want to open my own technology business? The word startup did not exist those days, as many years ago. Uh, I went to professor at the Technion and told them, teach me about how can I open a technology business? They said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't teach how to courses. We teach principles. 1996, I became, a, oops, sorry, I became a full professor. Uh, and uh, so I said, okay, now I can do whatever I want. I want to study how to become an entrepreneur. And in order to do that, I will open a class. And I consulted with you, Shlomo, at the time, and with another person, and we opened this uh, class. The class was an amazing success. It was the largest technical class ever. Uh, in the Churchill Auditorium, there were at the time 600 seats, 800 people came to the first lecture. It was an amazing success. The class continued till today. Today, Shlomo takes care of it. I ran it with the help of Shlomo for 30 years. I retired, Shlomo still takes care of it. So the class continued till from, from the early days of 1987. What is the idea? The idea is the following. As I mentioned before, the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, resource of every country is human ingenuity. 
This is the greatest natural resource. Okay, so let's say you develop human ingenuity. Now, what do you do with it? And today, the best thing you can do, besides becoming, of course, a professor at the Technion, is opening a startup. Open a technology startup. The, the return on investment is fantastic. Look at Israel with so many startups, but not only Israel. Many countries are many startups. Switzerland amazing number of startups and so are other countries mainly small countries united states the mother of entrepreneurship so many startups especially especially near great universities west coast yes california but also boston and, and other places uh, johns hopkins university maryland and many other places around universities these places develop around universities so the best thing that you can do with human ingenuity is open a startup but how to open a startup you have to learn how to do that it's like any other thing you have to learn how to do that and i said i will teach technolo technological entrepreneurship but who am i to teach what do i know i brought people who could teach and those people were divided in our class into three parts the first part was entrepreneurs who made it big time they started from nothing and now they became billionaires so I brought them one after the other. And then the second part were people who were opening startup at the time and they had to struggle. And they told the students, what are the issues? How can you struggle? How can you succeed? And the last part of people were um, the professionals. Somebody who told about patent law, a lawyer who told about the limited company and how they open it. Uh, somebody who told patent, about the patent, somebody who told uh, about marketing, market survey, and so on. The class continued till today from 1987. Wonderful, wonderful survey. Thank you, Shlomo, so much for working together with me on this amazing time. It was a great pleasure. Danny, we have only two minutes. Uh, we have quite a lot of young viewers. Um, you have two minutes to give them some life advice um, about uh, creativity, um, career paths. Talk to the young people. What is your uh, short advice for, for young people? Okay. My advice for countries that we start with it. By the way, you mentioned I traveled around the world. Every year I traveled and gave talks in 30 cities around the world. Every year, 30 cities around the world. And in each city, probably two lectures. There's more than 100 lectures professional different lectures on different many different subjects all around the world i i traveled far and wide i thought that the best thing a country could do to start doing things right is to teach science to young people teach science to young people in kindergarten and i opened that program uh in israel on israeli television and in haifa which is a model for a special science kindergarten I encourage people around the world to come to Haifa to see the science kindergarten and their amazing success. So start there and then encourage as many people as you can to study science and engineering. It's a scientist, engineer, biologist, medical doctor. These are the people that open startups. So encourage people to do that and encourage countries to teach that. Encourage television channels to teach science on television. Young children are glued to the television. Teach them science. Thank you, Danny. I'm going to squeeze in one last question, even though we're a bit over time, really briefly. We have a question um, <clears throat> from a viewer about the, the pandemic, the virus, and decisions being made by politicians who don't understand the science. How can we get scientists more involved to guide our country on the basis of science and not politics? Yes. Well, first thing you have to understand, all our 352 viewers, that um, scientists are more important than football players and, and pop singers. Overall, in contribution to society, your life is so good now, not in the days of Corona maybe, but otherwise because of science. And the more science we have, the better we will be. 
this is uh, this is uh, number one. Uh, about the corona uh, endemic, um, we still don't understand how it works. We are learning day by day. We are becoming more knowledgeable about it. Um, the corona endemic, the problem is in the management. It's a management problem. And many countries do not know how to manage it because many, many countries are not, are not used to answer questions, uh, such big questions in such short a time. And, and I encourage you to listen to really good people around the world. Uh, Giora Island in Israel, listen to this wise man. Uh, he will tell you what, how to do it right. The doctors are the heroes. The nurses are the heroes. Um, the military people who bring food to each and every home of a sick person are really heroes. There are many heroes discovered nowadays. And we didn't think the doctors and nurses are heroes. They are the greatest hero of our times. Thank you, Danny. I might just mention your son, Yoav, is a professor at Technion, using microscope skills to, to help identify uh, virus antibodies, um, like father, like son. Danny, that was fascinating. Thank you so much on behalf of Israel's story. All the best, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Shlomo. Good talking to you. Thank Have you a good so evening much. and a good Thank morning in the United States. Thank you so much, uh, Shlomo and, uh, and Danny. Uh, that was really fascinating and an inspiration to, uh, to all of us. Um, and uh, thank you for, for your time and for, for sharing your thoughts.